Pleasure to welcome the birthday girl and my sister in truth, Carol Campbell, to give us the message. Carol. Thank you. Secrets out. <laughs> it's my birthday. <laughs> Today, I recognize and acknowledge that I am wonderfully and beautifully made. <laughs> Today, I celebrate who I am and who I am becoming still. I am a vital expression of life's wholeness and well-being, free to create a life filled with boundless joy. No outmoded false beliefs and perceived limitations hold me back now. I am a participant in this wondrous life unfolding as a magnificent process of change and growth. I am that I am. I give thanks. I truly give thanks. Now, I'm not embarrassed to tell you that there was a time not so long ago that those words would have stuck in my throat as a big lie I thought they were. I couldn't accept a simple compliment, much less tell myself that I was worth celebrating. Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of this teaching known as the Science of Mind, writing in the textbook of the same name says, and I quote, within us is the unborn possibility of limitless experience. Ours is the privilege of giving birth to it, end quote. So I've titled my talk this morning, Living a Limitless Life. When I discovered the science of mind some 30 odd years ago, or rather it discovered me I was at an extremely low point. You know, they say people come into this teaching either through desperation or inspiration. <laughs> I'll spare you the gory details, but I was ready to chuck it all in. The fact that I'm here to tell the tale is proof enough that God, or life, had plans for me, desperate as I was. The current of life is a constant ebb and flow just like the tides. And just as the sea doesn't panic when there's an ebb, it simply gathers strength for the flow, increasing momentum as it surges forward. So we too can choose to experience life. I have come to see myself as a ripple in the sea of God, to borrow Oprah's phrase, with a limitless potential that can touch unseen shores, and merge with other ripples to create tsunamis of change. And as I'm saying that, I'm getting goosebumps. <laughs> because that is my statement of purpose for my life. Our Declaration of Principles states, we believe in the direct revelation of truth through the intuitive and spiritual nature of man, and that any man may become a revealer of truth who lives in close contact with the indwelling God. If we personalize this statement, it could read, as I live in close contact with the indwelling God, I am a revealer of truth through my intuitive and spiritual nature. Do you want to say that? OK, I'll break it down. As I live in close contact with the indwelling God, I am a revealer of truth through my intuitive and spiritual nature. How did I get from there to here? <laughs> there was not one road, a direct flight, a travel plan with every detail outlined. No, not at all. My life has taken dramatic turns 
spiraled out of control, stayed on an even keel sometimes, soared, then crashed, then soared again, and still I rise. But always, I emerge stronger with valuable lessons learned that I bundle up and take on the next leg, leaving behind the rubble and ashes. The journey of life as we grow older should be a time of improvement, of deepening understanding, of fearless acceptance instead of despair at every bump in the road, of willingness born of wisdom rather than the willfulness of exuberant youth. We don't arrive with an instruction manual. Our parents and other caregivers did the best they could, but they too were figuring it out as we went along. It's a bit like watching an experienced sailor out at sea, merrily bobbing along until you decide to try it and discover that it's not enough to simply not rock the boat. You have to keep your wits about you, you have to keep your eyes open, know the terrain, be aware that there's water underneath, and you have to row or trim the sails to guide the boat, which are all very easy to look at. <laughs> but when you're doing it, while it may be fun, it's not as easy as it looks if you're not used to it. I spent Easter weekend in Montego Bay with my family, and my niece and I decided to go kayaking. How difficult could that be, right? <laughs> Other people were doing it and seemed to be having great fun. Though, did I mention neither of us had ever been in a kayak before? <laughs> and it was a very windy day. Well, we could not control this thing for love nor money. <laughs> and no amount of bullying or cajoling would make it go where we wanted it to go. It was going every which way than where we wanted to go. When we finally made it back to shore, having discovered muscles that we didn't even know we had, the lifeguard was firing up the rescue boat with a very worried look on his face. <laughs> we managed to have a good laugh, but it was also a good life lesson. We have no idea what lies ahead or how we will manage in a new experience. So how did we make it back to shore? We simultaneously pulled in the oars, took a deep breath, centered ourselves and said, okay, we can do this. And we discovered it wasn't necessary to row furiously. We could stroke and glide, and stroke and glide. What else could it be but intuition? All of a sudden the kayak was cooperating. <laughs> We didn't have any other instructor except ourselves. And afterwards we learned that's how you're really supposed to do it. <laughs> we could learn to approach life in a similar fashion. We do our part, stroke, and let life do its part, glide. And working together, we let life guide us to the next appropriate stroke that will take us straight ahead, turn left, turn right, and before you know it, we're on a pathway. You know, the flow of time is continually giving us a new river of experience in which to gather information and stretch our possibilities beyond present limitations. It's about allowing rather than controlling. Every day presents us with a new world, a new perspective, a new possibility of experiencing more, of growing and developing. Every experience is simply a reflection of how we see ourselves. So the depth and breadth of our development is linked to an expanded, up-leveled vision of who we are knowing ourselves to be at any point in time. Do you know that when a bird is alive, the bird eats ants? When the bird dies, ants eat the bird. <laughs> one tree can make a million matchsticks, but it only takes one matchstick to burn a million trees. The ebb and flow, the ebb and flow. If we want to change any aspect of our lives, physical, mental, emotional, experiential, 
we must first change our awareness of it. The cornerstone of this teaching is change your thinking, change your life. Change the way you think about an event and your experience of it changes. I want you to listen to a song by Judy Armstrong, a practitioner from the Joy of Living Center in the Spiritual Living Center in Calgary, whom I met last summer while visiting the center. The song is called Have a Real Good Time, and it's from her CD, Time to Shine. Listen very carefully to the words. If you're tired of trying, struggling through your day, and you keep on whining, to play when you get the feeling life's just passing you by we'll start your life all over again and just have a real good time you gotta strip down all of your worries you gotta take off all of your kids and shove them out of the door. You gotta shake those paradigms, but two by two, not one at a time. You gotta blow it out of your attitude, baby. Then you. Time. If it's getting harder just to let life flow, then be a self starter. You just gotta let go. If you're tired of waiting. Just have a real good time You gotta strip down All of your worries Throw them on the floor You gotta take off All of your cares And shove them out of the door You gotta shake those paradigms Two by two, not one at a time You gotta blow it out of your attitude, baby Then you'll find you have a real good time Well, then you'll find you have a real good One more time, you know that I'm gonna those paradigms are two by two, not one at a time. You gotta blow it out of your attitude, baby, to get in the flow. You gotta let go, wipe off that brow, let your hair down, then you'll find you have a real good. so much, Judy, if you're listening. <laughs> now that's all about making choices, about letting go and allowing. Last Tuesday, practitioner Courtney Johnson gave us some very interesting ideas about expectations and how they may affect all relationships that we have, 
including the relationship with ourselves. Now, you know, if you miss the Tuesday evening spiritual enrichment services, you miss something. It is where you get insightful conversations, where you get to discuss. So make a date, Tuesday at 6 o'clock. These expectations initiate certain attitudes, perspectives, and experiences. We learn to interpret some things as good or bad, pleasant or unpleasant, loving, unloving, etc., etc. As with Adam and Eve in the Edenic state, they had no problem until they became aware through error thinking of a separate reality from God. Then they saw themselves as lacking, naked, and disconnected from the divine source, the unity back of all things. The only way to return to that reality, to salvage that relationship, or any relationship for that matter, is to change the interpretation of the event and minimize expectations. If we choose, we can experience ourselves in a constant state of unity with everything and everyone we contact. And I know that sounds like a tall order, but it can be done. This unified state of consciousness affects our physical bodies as well as our emotional states because there is a mind-body connection. In Deepak Chopra's book, Ageless Body, Timeless Mind, he says, and I quote, the transformation from separation to unity, from conflict to peace, is the goal of all spiritual traditions. Don't we live in the same objective world? The disciple asked his guru. Yes, the master replied, but you see yourself in the world. I see the world in myself, end quote. This small shift in perception makes all the difference. We create all kinds of disorder by seeing ourselves as separate and isolated, not just from each other, but from our source. Chopra continues, despite the appearance of being separate individuals, we are all connected to patterns of intelligence governing the cosmos. Death, the final state of separation, looms as a fearsome unknown. The very prospect of change, which is a part of life, creates untold dread because it connotes loss. Well, I know nobody in here thinks like that, right? <laughs> now, the older we get, the more likely we are to become more aware of this next phase of life as we notice more and more of our friends and relatives settling into the departure lounge and us bidding them bon voyage. If we succumb to this stereotypical vision of aging, it would appear that what we have to look forward to is mental and physical decay till we deteriorate and disintegrate like aged paper. What is that? What is that to thee? Look around you. Right here in this room, we're surrounded by people in their 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, who are vibrantly alive, mentally alert, with mature perspectives, seasoned creativity, and spiritual vision. I won't bother to tell you how old I am. <laughs> but I'm, I'm in there, OK? <laughs> that is the gift of aging that you can access when you practice what we teach. Dr. Ernest Holmes, again writing the Science of Mind text, says, and I quote, people don't stop living because they grow old. They grow old because they stop living, end quote. Our physical bodies will change. Who wants to stay the same anyway? But any change, is simply giving us an opportunity to experience life in a new way. Think about it. What a great opportunity to release the past and step into a new vision of ourselves with a few added wisdom lines, silvered hair, and softer contours. <laughs> we have first-hand knowledge of life. There is nothing between life and the experience of living. Life lives, and we're part of it. There is nothing between God and the reality of God in man as man. God is life, and life lives 
through us. It is through this revelation that we come to understand life. Holmes again states, man must know that he is an eternal being on the path of life, with certainty behind him, certainty before him, and certainty accompanying him all the way. It is up to us to allow a new perception of things. We choose how we show up in this life, as a possibility or as a liability. So today, say, I'll say it once and then you're going to say it with me. Today I express the limitless life of the all good. Within me is that which is perfect and complete. Today I express the limitless life of the all good. Within me is that which is perfect and complete. So embrace change, embrace growth and evolution. Wonder comes from a new perception, a new perspective, not the same old, same old story. As Rumi, the Sufi poet said, sell bewilderment and buy wonder. Let your story be about nurturing your life in every way possible by opening yourself to new ways of thinking and feeling and enjoying the journey. I'm going to close with a poem called The Journey by Pulitzer Prize winner, winning author Mary Oliver. One day, you finally knew what you had to do and began though the voices around you kept shouting their bad advice, though the whole house began to tremble and you felt the old tug at your ankles. Mend my life, each voice cried, but you didn't stop. You knew what you had to do, though the wind pried with its stiff fingers at the very foundations, though their melancholy was terrible. It was already late enough and a wild night and the road full of fallen branches and stones. But little by little, as you left their voices behind, the stars began to burn through the sheets of clouds, and there was a new voice which you slowly recognized as your own. That kept you company as you strode deeper and deeper into the world, determined to do the only thing you could do, determined to save the only life you could save. Have a wonderful week. Namaste.